as I think about that song, even send the light, where does the light have to come from? Kind of the same idea about the lesson today of, you know, happy Father's Day to the fathers in the crowd and those online or listening, but also just the thought of, you know, today's lesson thinking about, about my father. You know, and I'm looking at it kind of under the idea of listening to Christ. You know, we look at, into the New Testament, we listen to the words of Christ or of the apostles, but where did it all come from? The apostles got it from Christ. Christ gets it from the Father. So uh, starting in John chapter 5 and starting in verse 16, you know, 16 is wrapping up the previous thought and, it bring, and bridges us up into verse 17 so and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day you know but Jesus answered them my father works and I work therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For, I, for what things soever he doeth, there also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickened them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. That he honors not the Son, honors not the Father which has sent him. We look at the idea of, we see like that reflection. You know, when you walk up to someone and you see the physical characteristics of this person, it's like, I know you. Well, we may not know them, but we know their father. We know their parents. You are the spitting image of your parents. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. One of the points here is that, you know, by knowing the son, we know the father. By looking at this, he learned what he knows from the father. Now, Christ being part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're, it's a little bit different situation than what we might typically think. You know, he did, his learning curve was a lot less than ours is. You know, we grow up, our parents help us, nurture us, train us, and, okay, sometimes you get that comment saying, you know, do what's right because you are my son. You know, you are an image of us. You are a reflection of us. Just a thought that's come in my head as I was looking at this lesson or thinking about it is on Father's Day, how many received or gave their uh, dads a best dad or greatest dad's gift? I remember going through school, all of a sudden the little fundraiser things go around. There's going to be something in there if it hits around Father's Day so that we can make sure we spend some extra money on this fundraiser to give our dads the best dads. If we were to try and give our Heavenly Father something, I wouldn't say best dad or greatest dad, but, you know, greatest father of the world. Could we easily give that to him? You know, if we could give him a material blessing or a material item, would that be something that would even cross our mind to think of our Heavenly Father as the greatest father on Father's Day? Not to take away from our earthly fathers here, or, you know, during the day that we celebrate it here, but do we think about something like that? The influence of the father will help shape the child as they grow and who they are as they develop. Both our earthly father and should our earthly father choose to share the heavenly father. What kind of man will I become? What kind of uh, man will the next generation become? Will they be complete? Or a lot of times in the scriptures it says, that a man may be perfect. You know, perfect not being without sin and without faults, but that they are whole, complete, have all that they need. 
So as we look through the lesson, my thought is, how did Christ view his Father? Even though they are both part of the Godhead, they are also separate, and we see that view of how Christ looks up to God the Father. The first thing we have to know, know about is that do we know the Father? Do we even know who they are? Do we know anything about them? You know, we can say, oh yeah, God. But do we know him? Christ says that if we see him, then we see and know the Father in John chapter 6. I noticed that language inside of John more than the other Gospels is that he knows the Father. He sees the Father. We see it through him. So in John 6, 41 through 51, we see... Then the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not against yourselves. No man comes to me except the Father, which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and hath learned of the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save which he is of God, has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has, a, has, has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Can you imagine listening to those words and just be like, he is the bread of life. Eat of me. Um, no thanks, I just ate. You know, it's like it's not literally stick out your arm and start gnawing on it. You know, we're not at a country fried chicken. You know, we're not trying to, or Kentucky fried chicken. You know, it's not cannibalism. Even though he says he will give of his flesh, but that is, of course, as we realize, what we just partook of, the Lord's Supper. He gave of his flesh that we might live, but he did that also, and that this is not in the lesson, but because of the Father. The Father sent him for a task, and he completed all tasks that the Father sent him for. The words that he brought, the words that have come from his Father, the words that are there from heaven, the living bread, as he calls it here. But he says, every man that has heard has learned of the Father and comes to me. We know the Father if we know Christ, because He is not holding anything back from us. He has delivered it to us. He's delivering for our uh, physical needs and our spiritual needs. We see many times that Christ provides for us. He even, you know, in here it talks about the bread from the wilderness. I'll talk about that tonight. Is that we see the manna that came from heaven. In that time, the Israelites needed food because they just the entire grouping went out into the wilderness. There's only so much food you can carry, and they spent 40 years in the wilderness. You can't carry that much food out with you at one time. He provided for them physically. He provided for them spiritually. Here he's talking about the bread of life, the words that are given. We also see in John chapter 14 that Christ and the Father are one. John 14, starting in verse 7. If you have known me, Christ speaking, you have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Now a minute ago Jesus said that no man has seen the Father. But yet he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You know, that, that spitting image, that's my boy, he's my spitting image. He sent him down with all things. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, 
and if it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou, Show us the Father? Believe thou that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Can we say that we have that kind of a connection? You know, I look around and we see everyone has different relations with our fathers, with our mothers, with our siblings. Do we have that kind of a connection? You know, we see all sorts of things. And he says that the Father and I, Christ, the Son, God, the Father are so intertwined. If we see one, we see the other. We don't need to see God the Father to be able to see him. We see the Son. We see the evidence that He has. We see the works that He has done. And because they are so entwined, Christ says we must be about our Father's business. If we are that close, if we see Him, if we know Him, to truly know Him is more than just having the knowledge and information. We also have to be willing to do what it is because to know God is to understand that he wants us to act a certain way, to do certain things. So Jesus says, I must be about my father's business. In Luke chapter 2, and verse 49, And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? To know the context of that one right there, we have to go back through verse 41, and we see that this is the time when Jesus was about 12 years old. His family, as according to the traditions and the customs of the people of the time, went back to Jerusalem. They made their, their pilgrimage back. They were there, they spent their time there, they accomplished what was to be done, and everyone started home. Almost. You ever start looking around for your, your son and you can't find them, or your child? Where is that person? Where'd they go? Jesus pulled one of these on Joseph and Mary. As we look through verse 41, we see that now his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12, he went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled these days and returned, the child tarried behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and Mary knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought among him. Okay, we've been a whole day and we haven't seen him yet. Figured he was with one of the other kids. He hadn't shown up for meals yet. Where is that boy? I didn't miss meals. It'd be noticed if I wasn't at home. When they found him not, they turned back to Jerusalem seeking him. And came to pass after three days, they found him in the temple. Sit, so they're only one day's journey out, so they made it back and searched for two days. They finally found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Smart little 12-year-old. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you done this to us? Behold, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And then he responded with, I must be about my father's business and they did not know fully what was there but if we look down at verse 52 and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men he was about his father's business and part of that business was learning encouraging and growing and so he was sitting there in the temple 
discussing with others. Can you imagine being one of these people that are well-learned and knowledgeable and an adult and having a educated discussion with a 12-year-old about God? Many times we humor our children about these in-depth conversations they have with us, but imagine sitting with Jesus when he was only 12 even and having that kind of knowledge and information. And then in 52 it says he continued to increase to the point that we see him today through the rest of the scriptures as well. Jesus also tells us in various passages that he, we have to work the works of him who sent me. You know, I have come from the Father. I'm here to do my Father's business. I'm do, here to do the work. If we believe him, then we would do that work. We also look at the will of the Father, as he describes in several places. Going up to John chapter 8, verse 28, we see one of these examples of doing the will of the Father. John 8, 28. Then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And He said then, And He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. And he spake these words, and many believed on him. Do we do what the Father has commanded us to do? When our parents tell us to go and do something, do we do it? Do we know that we are part of them? That we are together in all these things? And hopefully we are of like mindset that we will be. God has said, here is my information, here is my love, here is my direction. Go along this pathway. Do we as his children fall obedient to his commands and his words? As we do these things, we can bring honor to the Father. Christ says, I am one with the Father. We are one. We are one. We are together. I do all things that, that he has given. Giving honor to the Father. Do we do that? World's greatest dad. We honor them. We give them a gift of appreciation, a token. I'm sure that that coffee mug is nowhere close to the amount that they should receive upon occasion for some of the things that we put them through, here on earth at least. And I'm sure it will be nowhere close to what is needed to give to God for what all he has given to us. But the word honor itself is defined as honestly, fairness or integrity of one's belief and actions. Or a source of credit and distinction. Or of high respect, worth and merit. Do we honor our Father? You know, obviously this is one of the commandments. We see this here. Honor your mother and father. Ephesians chapter 6 has a passage about honoring. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayst live long on the earth. Okay, fathers, we, have, we, we keep on going. And, and fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Honor our parents. Honor our fathers. It is the first commandment with promise. We also have fathers not provoking our children which makes it a lot easier to honor them when now okay sometimes the children provoke the parents but we also have this idea of 
this is the earthly saying for us today, but what does it spiritually mean as well? You know, what is the takeaway for it? You know, obviously, honor father and mother. We honor God. Should we take and give him that respect, that honor, that in, uh, our whole integrity, the worth? Is God worth it? Is our Heavenly Father worth it? Because we know that he does not provoke us to wrath. We'll look at trials this, this evening, and he does allow certain things to happen to make us grow, to help us. You know, our fathers are there to help dust us off and push us down the road, not to never let us fall. You know, sometimes we need that scraped knee to understand balance, to understand not letting ourselves get too fast for ourselves. But they can also be there to help pick us back up as needed as well. Christ also, as we give honor, Christ bears witness of the Father and his nature. But the question is, he also asks us, do we listen to this? John, going back into John chapter 5. Starting in verse 31. Jesus is saying, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. If he were to bear witness of himself, he is no better than those that stand on the street corner saying, look at me for my great words. Look at me for all these clothing. Look at me for... If he just said, I am of myself, then what is that? There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. You sent under John, and he bore witness to the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shimmering light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given to me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me, he bore witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape and yet you have you have not his words abiding in you for whom you have he has sent you believe not search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are which testify of me and you will not come unto me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receives honor one of another, and seek not the honor that comes from God only? Do not think I will... Accuse you to the Father, there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For you, for have you believed Moses? You would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writing, how shall you believe my words? Verse 36 really pushes it in, is like the works from the Father has given me to finish the same that I do. You are looking in the scriptures but you are not keeping them in your hearts and minds. Sad that that has fallen from their ideas and their ideals because they were told to write them on their doorposts, write them on their eyelids. The idea of keeping that information so close inside of them. Keep God's word with you. And yet they, they open up the book and it's just a bunch of words. Because Jesus says, you've searched the scriptures, but you don't even see me. How much have I done to prove that I am of God? They were too afraid to show that honor to the Father that they would lose that from each other. But as we even branch out from there, Christ was our great example. He is of the Father and He shared His information with us. What comes next? 
The next is that we have to take that example and put it in our lives. Paul took Timothy as his spiritual son. We look at the opening of each of his letters to Timothy, and he says that my beloved son in the faith. He put that in both letters. The fathers are to train their own children. We looked at the verse a minute ago in Ephesians 6. Proverbs, train up a child in the way that they should go, that they may not stumble from it. We also see how important it is. In 2 Timothy, we see where Paul is writing and showing the faith of Timothy. This young preacher able to take and start going forward and he's giving him admonition and encouragement. 2 Timothy 3, starting in 14. But continue thou in these things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now we see in uh, chapter 1 verse 5 that the faith has come from his grandmother Lois and continued with his mother Eunice and Paul includes himself that he has encouraged this as well. Why his father is not listed in this, I don't know. You know, maybe he did not, he wasn't around for it for whatever the reason is, but the faith coming from his grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice, and Paul, and again, we look at verse 2 in both, chap, in verse, both books, we see that he calls him a son in the faith. As a father figure to him, as a mentor to him, he is encouraging his spiritual son. Are our fathers today encouraging their sons in the faith? With these biblical examples from our fathers, for children to live by, we can grow that we sh who we should be and turn into the examples for the next generation. We look at the Great Commission for so many things, Matthew 28. Would that not also apply to this as well? So Matthew 28, when Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always to the end of the world all things he's teaching how to be a good parent he's teaching how to be a good servant he's teaching how to live a life that would bring honor to the father it also means honoring each other several times jesus said you know he was asked what is the greatest command he said honor god and honor your neighbors love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second is like it love thy neighbor as thyself Thy neighbor is anyone, not yourself. Every one of you is a neighbor. Everyone outside that's passing in the, the cars past the building is a neighbor. Love one another. Teach the next generation. Teach the next person. As we learn the characteristics of love as, and nurturing and of joy and of you know reaching out to others, we look at those characters we have to teach about God the Father we learn those characteristic traits from him which means we also teach how to be a good parent from God because what is God he is our father we look at the traits as they roll down and we see how our lives should be mirrored and if we are living as God as Christ has and as we looked at those scriptures I am with the father the father is with me everything I do is from the father what did Christ do in his life how did he respect his earthly mother and father when they came back from in the temple he got up and went home with them he didn't give them sass saying hang on let me keep on 
I must be about my father's business. And then he continued home with them. I'd imagine if you wanted a child, for the exception of knowing that the Savior was going to be sacrificed, I would imagine Christ would be a pretty good one to have. Because I don't see him causing any trouble until you're a day out on your journey and can't find your 12-year-old. Or know that he's not going to make it past about 33 years old. And that he would be humiliated the way he was. But think of that even from God's standpoint of the Father knowing that his people would reject his own son. But sent him anyway for us. Other examples in the Bible, we see how many times God referenced as the God of our fathers or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The faithfulness of these earthly fathers for their tribes, for their people, influenced the nation of Israel for how many years? It's even recorded still today that we can go back and look, the God of our fathers, the God of your fathers. Even Christ uses that, the apostles use that in the New Testament. The God of your fathers. Do we stop to remember our family history? Do we listen to our fathers and their fathers? How many stories have been passed down that we can learn from with the examples and lives? Every time someone departs, that history is lost. The beauty of God the Father is that he has recorded what we need to have. Acts 3.13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. He's reminding them of their history and of what was right in front of them. The love of a father for their child should be so great. We see God the Father has given us his son and wants us to abide, wants to abide with us. 1 John chapter 4, and then the lesson will be ours. 1 John chapter 4. starting with verse 12. <clears throat> no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. We can go up to another, you know, to a family and we can see the spitting image of the father and the son and we can say that is your son that is your father when we look at God when God looks at us does he see himself in us if he can see himself in us then we honor him we honor him through our actions through our abilities through our through what we do each and every day. Do we honor our earthly fathers by being as nice as we can to them and you know, not giving them too many gray hairs all at one time? Do we honor God the same way? Do we apply what we learn here to there? Do we do them both? If there are any needs of the congregation, there are quite a few prayer requests that have been made. You know, we've looked at those. There, are, Be ever mindful of those as well. But is there anything that we can help you with? If there is, we invite you to come while together we stand 
and sing.